Congratulations with your new album. Oh, thank you very much. We've been working uh, pretty hard on it, uh, I read on your, uh, your website, for a long time. Um, well, actually, this new album, 18, it, it was finished a lot faster than most of the other records I've made. Uh, like the last album, Play, took about a year and a half, whereas 18 took just under a year. The main reason for that is, it's kind of a boring reason, but is it technologically, 18 is the first record I made using this software called Pro Tools, and Pro Tools just enabled me to work a lot faster. So you mixed it all, you recorded it all on Pro Tools uh, at home? I'm, I've made all my records at home. Every, every record I've ever made, I've made in my bedroom. Yeah, but I mean, you don't record guitars, etc. in your bedroom, right? I mean, you yeah. must have, you do. I re <laughs> it sounds too good to be true because it sounds so good. Well, if you do something long enough, eventually you figure out how to do it well. And the thing with guitars, I mean, like the guitars on this album on 18 were recorded straight into Pro Tools just through you know, a preamp because there's this wonderful plug-in on Pro Tools called Amp Farm, which basically gives you access to every guitar amp ever made. So you don't even have to be a very good engineer to make guitars sound really good. You wrote a lot of songs for this album, right? Oh, I wrote 150 songs for this record. Uh, throughout, and I've been recording music for about 20 years since I was 16, and throughout my life I've probably written about, I don't know, 2,000 songs. But for this album, for 18, I wrote 150, and then I had to choose these 18 from those 150. That must be a difficult choice, right? Uh, it wasn't that difficult. I before making 18 i knew what kind of record i wanted to make i wanted to make a record that was melodic and warm and emotional so basically i just chose my favorite of the 150 songs i'd written that were melodic warm and emotional what do you do with, with the other songs do you you record them and you put them on a, on a disc or well sometimes other songs become b-sides sometimes i'll license them to movies sometimes i'll rework them for future albums but most of the time, they just end up sitting on a shelf collecting dust and no one will ever hear them. There's a lot of thinking about the universe uh, on uh, this CD. I had to think of uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which gave me, a, I don't, don't know if you know the book, but it's, it's a, it really gives you a nice reflection on your position within the universe at all. Do you, you think a lot or read a lot about the universe? Well, I've always been obsessed with outer space, and when I was young, I was really obsessed with science fiction. So, yeah, I mean, I'm certainly, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know that much about it. But one thing I find very fascinating is just trying to understand human culture in light of the rest of the universe. You know, because the universe is so vast and so, I mean, vast beyond our possible imaginings. And the universe is so old. So here we are, tiny little human beings alive for a few years in a universe that's 15 billion years old. And we're tucked away at some corner of the universe. So... <clears throat> as much as I love humanity and as much as I love human culture, it's really hard for us to take ourselves too seriously when we're so little in such a remote corner of the universe. A lot of people don't realize that. I mean, because a lot of people make a lot of fuss about, well, really unimportant things, actually. Yeah, I mean, the world is a complicated place, but, you know, human beings were alive for, you know, 70, 80 years in a universe that's 15 billion years old. So... I think the best thing we can do is just, you know, go out and climb trees and sit in the sun and just have a nice life and <laughs> because nothing else is worth the, the time. Another thing I was wondering about, uh, I, I was really impressed by your diary that you kept on the, on the web. Uh, you've been doing it for two years almost now. Um, are you ever going to print it in a booklet? Well, right now my website, we get two and a half million hits per week. And so I get hundreds of thousands of people reading my website every week, you know, reading my journal entries every week. So if I was to put out a book and the book sold 100,000 copies worldwide, that would be a huge success for a book. I reach many more people than that every week just through my website. So actually printing a book would mean reaching fewer people than I reach through my website. Do you reach your own diary backwards if you ever go to the web? Not usually. I usually I write it and then I never go back and read it. Maybe I should because it would make me better at writing. But no, for the most part, it's just this very spontaneous stream of conscious thing that I do. And it's just a way of you know communicating with people. A lot of people in Holland are struck by the fact that you uh, mentioned Pinfortuin on your website. You were in Brussels and you heard the news, right? 
was I in, I was either in Brussels. No, I was in Paris when I heard about him being assassinated. And yeah, I just remember being really, really sad. You know, not, not necessarily, I mean, I didn't, I didn't agree with his politics, but just... Did you know what was going on in Holland, actually? Yeah, I mean, I knew about, you know, the Pim Fortune list. Uh, I knew that he, he was just, you know, even if I didn't agree with his politics, he was just a really interesting politician. I mean, I understand why he's so popular here, because he was different. You know, he spoke his mind, and he was, even if I didn't agree with it, I was still, you have to, you have to admire someone who can be honest and speak their mind. And just a, the thought of, like, a, a political assassination is just so sad. Like, I remember when um, Rabin was shot in Israel years ago. I just remember my first thought was, okay, so th someone shot Rabin, and tomorrow morning his wife has to eat breakfast alone. And I just, I, I hate the fact that there are people who are willing to violently express their views and violently express their will, and it's, it's, it's always sad. What can you do against it? Because, I mean, uh, I, I, I have to agree with all the th different uh, statements you make in your booklet, in your CD, and on your website, and in your songs. But what do you do if, if really violent people come to you and fly to planes in the, in, in the buildings or shoot politicians? I mean, how do you, do you react to that? I mean, what should, should you do with those people? To me, it's mind-boggling, actually. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, one of the goals of democratic society is to protect people's freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of assembly. But then the moment that someone inflicts their will violently upon other people, we as dem citizens of democratic society have our right to stop them, you know? And if it's just one individual, then we give ourselves the right to stop that individual. If it's a group of individuals who all believe something that leads them to hurt other people, then we give ourselves the right to stop them, you know, because our society is based on one idea, which is that you're not allowed to force your will on other people. And anyone who tries to force their will on another person should be stopped. Hey, you are, you are touring uh, with uh, Area 2 soon, uh, I, I hear. Could you explain to listeners what Area 2 is? Well, last year I did a festival in the United States called Area 1. It was a traveling festival because the United States is so big. and Area One was myself and Outcast and Incubus and New Order and The Roots and Nelly Furtado and Paul Oakenfold and a bunch of other DJs. And this year, Area Two is David Bowie, myself, Busta Rhymes, the Blue Man Group, Ash. DJ uh, Tiesto here. Yeah, Tiesto's doing it. Uh, Carl Cox, Digweed, the Avalanches. So it's it's a really interesting. And your fans put put the lineup together, right? I mean, you can go to the website and go like, well, I really like to see Paul Oakenfold or. Well, I mean, ultimately. I, I put the lineup together. I just like to ask people's opinions. So six months ago when I was putting this lineup together, I just sent an email out asking people what they wanted to see. And just because it, it gives me an indication of you know, what my fans like. And then you, you I mean, if, if a lot of people like a certain artist, you incorporate or try to incorporate that artist on your lineup? Well, if, if it's something I like as well. I mean, one of the things I really wanted on Area 1 and I really wanted on Area 2, but that wasn't available, was Radiohead. And... You know, for whatever reason, Radiohead just didn't want to do it. So, yeah, but, I mean, the lineup we have, I mean, the fact that I'm, I'm going on tour with David Bowie and Busta Rhymes, I think that's really cool. So how did you get on tour with David Bowie? I mean, you, you get to know him, I guess? Yeah, I first met Bowie about five years ago, five or six years ago, and we've just sort of been friends ever since. Uh, and, yeah, we worked together. Like, I had this really interesting experience Last year, he was playing at Carnegie Hall in New York City and ended up playing guitar with him for Heroes, which is one of my favorite songs ever made. So that was a really wonderful experience. I really like the interview you guys did together on the website where he's asking questions and then vice versa. A question I really liked was, did you ever kiss somebody while your record was on? And if so, how did it make you feel? Well, I have a couple of times. And because, I mean, a lot of the music I've made has been instrumental music. So... If I'm kissing someone listening to instrumental music I've made, that's okay. But to try and kiss someone where if, if I was listening to my own voice, that would be too strange. I, I, there's no way I could do that. You never did? I have. I just don't. It's, it's, it's too weird to be kissing someone and hearing myself singing in the background. So it's not something I ever want to do again. 
The title of the album is 18. Is it because there are 18 songs on it? No. Well, one reason why the album is called 18 is because there are 18 songs on it. Also, I wanted to have a title that was a number, so that way people in different countries would ask for it by a different name. You know, someone in France could ask for Dizuit, and Germany they'll ask for Achtzen. I think, how do you say 18 in Dutch? Achim. So, you know, in Spain, be Ocho and Japan, Juhachi. So that way, every country will pronounce the name of the, name of the record differently. Eminem dissed you officially on his uh, first single, I guess, or almost a new album. Uh, you were really delighted about that, right? I thought it was really flattering. Uh, I mean, the fact that Eminem would go out of his way to diss me, and in the video, he dresses up like Osama Bin Laden, Elvis Presley, and me, which is way up there. Quite a compliment, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure.